is our homesteading series on Apple production. And I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items of our business development, uh, a little bit about Appalachian Orchard Company, and then for any questions that we may have, you can put those in the chat box. We ask that you leave your videos off. It seems to run a lot more seamlessly uh, with videos off. Julie and Phil, you're more than welcome to turn yours on if you care to. Um, but we ask the rest of the group to, to please stay muted uh, until you're asking questions and, and also video uh, off until the end of the presentation. So our planning coordinators, which my position, Nathan Bergdahl, I'm in the Eastern Panhandle in the blue. Uh, we've got Casey Ganser in the Northern Panhandle in the orange. Lacey Davidson Ferguson in the green and the southwestern portion of the state, and also Ashley Amos in the purple in the southeastern part of the state. Also, newly on board, we have Sierra Cox, who is our, our leader of our Veterans and Heroes program, and Michelle Parsons, who is with us tonight and uh, leading the charge. So, with that, Here's a little bit of our West Virginia Grown program, who Appalachian Orchard Company is a part of. It's our premier branding program in the state of West Virginia. Uh, we just put out a directory uh, not long ago, a few months ago, that uh, includes a little, a little snippet, pictures, location, website, contact information, and how you can get a hold of those folks in the West Virginia Grown pr program and source some of our local product here that we have in the state. Our Veterans and Heroes to Agriculture program, as I just mentioned, newly on board, Sierra Cox. Um, they have scholarship opportunities, marketing opportunities, uh, business development, ag industries, uh, all types of, of wonderful things happening in our Veteran and Heroes to Agriculture program. And with that, I will kick over to our video and we'll get started with Appalachian Orchard Company. All right, let's get started with our video from Appalachian Orchard Company and Phil Bulliard. Hi, I'm Phil Bulliard with the Appalachian Orchard Company in Martinsburg, West Virginia, of Berkeley County. Uh, my wife and I and our father -in -law, her fa my father-in-law run Appalachian Orchard together. We are about 550 acres of apple orchard. So now I know how we do apples is a little different than maybe you would want to do it. But anyone can grow apples. Start with preparing the land. You gotta get it tilled up. Pick your varieties that you want. Uh, decide what time of year. You always remember with apples, you have to have pollinators so there's plenty of charts you can find anywhere online that'll show you which two trees will pollinate each other uh, right now i'm standing in the middle of a red block they're picking the goldens already here but reds and goldens always do work together and once you figure out which varieties you want to use together uh, you can start working on planting your trees uh, figuring out which nursery you would like to get them off of uh, there are many around this area up near Pennsylvania has several and then I'm sure everyone that has some type of farm experience do, and has bought and farm stuff do get catalogs that have trees in them that you can buy. Okay this is probably about a three or four year old tree here but they'll be pretty similar in size when you get them. Um, so I'll show you how we prune our trees. We, all of ours are done on what's called a central leader system. There's multiple other ways that you can find online. Some of the newer ones that we're planning, we're doing what's called a tall spindle. But um, you're just basically getting the shape of the tree right. Uh, we try not to have anything below your knee. So when you put your knee in there, you see kind of where it goes. That's just, for us, that's for the ease of mowing. For you, it would be the same thing. And then, as the name says, central leader. Whichever one of these you want to be your strongest one. And then you always just nip the tip of it off because there's always going to be a bud up there that if it, something 
something would happen it would set an apple wheel bend it over and can't cause your top to break out and then after that you're just kind of spreading your limbs out Got too many going in the exact same direction you just have to get rid of some of them anything you're seeing very straight up or straight down is going to be a waste of a limb so and that's pretty much all there is to pruning until you get to a bigger tree and then you're just making more cuts but okay. now we're here with a tree that's probably 15 16 17 years old in that time range um, to get to this time we've done we've taken care of the tree multiple years we have pruned it every year we start pruning anytime after Thanksgiving as the leaves start coming off the trees anytime up until we start getting the buds breaking through is our ideal pruning time. You can always prune any time of the year. It's just easier when you have less leaf on the tree. So we go through every year. We keep the grass mowed down around our trees. We try to keep, uh, we monitor all of our trees with um, different insect traps we have spread out through our orchard so that we know what insects we have and, and we try to spray only when needed just for our cost savings. We also go buy different charts that you have for different funguses that are growing just to know certain temperatures and certain weather conditions that go cause an infection. Sometimes you don't have an infection if it's real hot or real cold, even though there's the fungus out there. Um, after that, through the year, we're just trying to maintain the crop load, red delicious, we like a small apple, so you can see the apples are very heavy on the tree just to keep the right size. Uh, if we need to and start to see that the tree is starting to break down, starting to break limbs, we will go through and take some of them off. Um, certain varieties need to be high, high collar, like our galas, which we've already picked this year. We go through and spread them out even farther, and we do prune them in the summertime cutting any of these type of limbs that have no fruit on them, but are just blocking shade so we can get some sun on them to try to get more color. When it comes to soil for your apple trees, most types of soil will work for apple trees. Uh, in the Eastern Panhandle where we're at, most of the soils where we have our trees are loamy with some clay mixed in. Uh, we actually do have a lot of rock in our soil. Uh, they call it churdy, which has a bunch of little rocks, which for people that plant potatoes or something like that would hate it. But for apple orchards or a tree or any type of tree crop where it's gonna be there for a long time, it is actually good because you're gonna be driving up and down the middles, mowing, spraying, taking care of that tree for up to 30 years, depending on how healthy the tree can stay. And that will actually keep the soil from compacting around the roots and keep the roots spreading when you have nice nice fine fine soil you do actually compact it down around the roots and it is bad for the apple trees that being said once you do have your trees planted your tree will tell you real quickly if it's lacking something some nutrient uh, as you can see the leaves we have here are all green healthy they're all even collar um, there's nothing really wrong around this ground. We do always, before we prep a block, we do lime the area. We then always do, a, like I just said, triple fer 19 fertilizer on the ground just to get the ground prepped to try to get some vigor in the younger trees, get the roots going faster. And then as the tree gets older, mostly we leave it alone other than checking the leaves every once in a while if you see, if you start seeing leaves on your trees like these that have some yellowing on them or some, any type of discoloring or just getting to a light uglier green it's telling you something that you have some type of nutrient um, deficiency in the soil and any of your local um, extension agents has always been willing to help us with taking soil samples WBU has helped us, Penn State has helped us, Virginia Tech has helped us. Those are just some of the universities that we work with to either take a soil sample to see if we're lacking something that we need to do a special type of fertilizer in an area or by doing a leaf sample where they will take the 
see through the leaf what we're missing and see what we need to do. And we, we can either put on the fertilizer or the nutrient either through a foliar spray with our sprayers or we can do it in the springtime with a fertilizer. If here we are in one of our orchards, we're picking some of our golden delicious trees. Uh, picking for anyone is about the same. We just do it on a larger scale than you would be. But we're using ladders, we're using our picking sacks, uh, picking our apples. We're going quickly, but if you can, if you could slow it down, you would notice that they are using their hands very gently. They are trying not to bruise. They're laying the apples down in the sack. Apples are fairly easy to bruise, so we're trying to put our hand down as far as we can when we pick them, just so that they don't bruise them. Now, if you're doing something like a sauce or a cider or a juice, it really doesn't matter how easily you handle them. But most of our apples are trying to go to a store where the looks matter a lot, so we're trying to take as great care as we can picking them. I'm being gentle, watching where we place the ladder, trying to knock, knock as many off as we can. For us at Appalachian Orchard Company, uh, we're probably averaging around anywhere between 10 to 20 bushel per tree sometimes a little more of that especially our golden delicious tree are very loaded this year your quantity can be anything it can be any certain number our our trees are what's called a three-quarter size tree uh, so it's not a seedling it's been shrunk down a little bit we do have some younger blocks uh, newer blocks i should say that are our more dwarfing root stock and the goal on those is probably about a bushel of tree. They're a lot closer together, but they are also a lot more, um, a lot more work heavy. Uh, you have to have a trellis. They're not freestanding. Our trees are all freestanding. Uh, they should very seldom ever be bothered with in a windstorm, even when they do have a heavy load of fruit on them. Uh, the smaller trees do need to be trellised or tied and staked. And then still at that time, they still can break even with a load on when they have a load on them. Uh, that being said, anyone can really plant trees to grow them themselves. You just have to be able to keep an eye on them, make sure they got the right nutrients going to them. Like I said, your leaves will tell you if that's being done right. Uh, hope you some good luck with the weather. And then just make sure you're checking your insects, make the pressure, make sure you're checking your disease pressure, and then hopefully by the end of your time, you'll be able to have a good crop of apples. Uh, at Appalachian Orchard Company, we're aiming for probably about 300,000 bushel this year on 500 acres, and that's probably about 20 different varieties added together, and we'll start picking in early August. Uh, September, around September 10th, sometime then we'll start on our reds, goldens, what you would consider more your fall apples, going clear up to Fuji's, York's, Granny Smith's, Pink Ladies, and we'll be picking at least six days a week until we're done. Apples are no different than any other plant. In the springtime, when you, after you start having your buds starting to move, you start seeing some green growth, uh, they are susceptible to frost damage. A lot of people do do things like put uh, blankets over their house plants. Here at Appalachian Orchard Company, we have multiple wind machines like the one behind me, which are just gas engines uh, running the big propeller that you see in the sky. It'll start stirring the air on a real still night. Your low spots will be five, ten degrees colder than the rest of the area. And what you're doing is you're shoving the cold air out in that area letting the warm air up on top of your hills fall down in that area to keep the uh, buds warm and not allow frost to set. So there we have it. Uh, Julie and Phil. Phil, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to uh, allow me to come out to do that. I had a tremendous time and and learned a lot um before i started throwing questions at you 
Does anyone else have any questions for Julie or Phil? Feel free to take yourself off mute or you can drop it in the chat box if you prefer to, to do it that way. OK, well, if you do chime in, I've got one for you. Um, the aging and years to production. Um, I know most of most apple trees take many years to to come to fruition and, and yield the type of production that you're looking for. Could you talk a little bit about how many years and the second part of that question, does it vary by variety on on years to production and full yield? Um, for us, we for well, for most commercial growers, the, your first two years, you're always taking all blooms off or any fruit off. You're trying just to grow solely the tree to get the tree grown as fast as you can and to establish it. Um, and then after that, maybe year three, year four, you're leaving just a very, very minimum amount of fruit on just to kind of start helping shape the tree, pull the limbs where you want them. Uh, your full size trees, it could take up to probably seven, eight years before you start having what you would call a full crop on the tree. Um, like your dwarf trees, the ones I was talking about that are real close together, that you see like in a pick your own operation, it's usually year four or five that they're, they're trying to get them um, established a little faster. And by year four or five, they're starting to have a pretty sizable crop for their, that, that tree. Um, as far as varieties, uh, red delicious always grow real slow. Honey crisp grow real slow. Um, galas have a lot of vigor. Goldens always have a lot of vigor. Uh, as far as setting a large crop, I, all trees try to grow the fruit fast, but I mean, the, just the sheer size of the tree and the amount of capacity it can handle is what really um, varies by variety. And and how many how many acres did you start off with? How many trees did you start off with when you first started your operation? Did you did you straight hop to shooting for three hundred thousand bushels on five hundred acres, or did you start a little bit smaller than that and then and then build up? Well, Julie's the third I, third generation. So. Yeah, I could probably hop in here. My granddad started selling apples uh, off of rented orchards back, you know, in the early 50s. And he slowly began to buy small parcels of land that were already in orchard. Um, and then as pieces of property came available for sale around the main piece that he had bought, that he kind of wanted to be the center of his of his uh, operation, he would buy those little parts and pieces. And so even now we have plot locations that are that are like Miller Farm and Catro Farm and all of these different farms that have kind of been piecemealed together to create what actually was the 1100 acre orchard before our operation underwent a corporate split for transition planning. And so there's some peaches, some apples. I would say he started growing, you know, trees that were 25 and 30 feet tall back in the 50s. And so we've slowly transitioned into more semi-dwarfing and I think that as science gets better and as we become better stewards of the land and of the trees, the production per acre does continue to go up. Um, we we have blocks this year that were, you know, 2,600 bushels to the acre, which is phenomenal. Um, I think our county yield, according to the state of West Virginia, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 bushels to the acre. So, yeah, I mean, just technology keeps 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 marching on and we keep trying to do everything that we can do to get the production up to become a more profitable business. Very good. Thank you for that. Do, do you have any advice for this is obviously a homesteading series webinar. You are probably not qualified as a 
homesteader uh, doing 300,000 on 500 acres. Do you have any advice for someone that wants to put 20, 40 trees in the backyard and and start from there as a homesteader on apple production? Do you have any tidbits of information on, on how to best go about that? Uh, your, your biggest problem is always going to be deer um, from anyone I've ever seen try to do it just with a few in their backyard here or there. Uh, the deer pressure almost anywhere in West Virginia is tremendous. Uh, that that's your biggest problem. I and then just if you want to have the perfect grocery store looking apple, uh, you it's hard without the perfect spray program like what we run. But you I, for apples that you are perfectly fine to eat, perfectly fine for making apple butter, applesauce, apple cider. Um, it, it's doable, and you just gotta keep the, the major problem is deer. As far as everyone I've ever talked to, everyone I've ever had ask me questions. And and I would like to add in there too that I think it would be really important to make a smart choice on rootstock and variety, uh, because you know if you want to just have a Honeycrisp tree in your yard, you might pick a couple Honeycrisp that as a homesteader aren't going to store very long and aren't going to keep very well. So I think you would want to choose one of those older varieties that probably are a little bit more acclimated to keep longer that when you pick the fruit a little bit later in October or November, they store really well in a cellar. Uh, those varieties here would be like a York or a Fuji stores pretty well or a Pink Lady, something that's going to have longevity in your home to be used for fresh fruit longer through the year. Yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of... I, the varieties that the grocery stores are going away from are the ones that your, I guess, homesteaders, your farmers that had a few cows, a few pigs, a couple apple trees, they would be more on like what my, Julie said with the Yorks and stuff where you could put them in a root cellar and they would last. Four, five, winter. six yeah. months. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those apples are really good for a very long time and they're good for more uses. You can dry them. You can make them into applesauce. They cook well. They would cook down into apple pies. You could freeze the um, any kind of like stewed apples or fried apples that you made ahead of time. You could freeze all of those products. A lot of the newer varieties, the apples that start in, you know, August, like a ginger gold or a galo or a honey crisp, those are not going to have the storability. And they're, the, the, they're also going to be a little bit more susceptible to some problems in the orchard just because they don't have the kind of history of, they're not being bred. developed for that purpose of homesteading. Yeah. In in general, if you're like trying to figure out what variety you want to pick as you're looking at your ripening chart, in general, the later you pick it, the longer it will last in storage. Your early earlier you pick something, the you're going up to maybe a month at the most you can keep it in storage to um your last apples you pick. I mean, just in a refrigerator, Julie's grandma would put at the office would put Fuji's that we'd pick and she'd be eating them all summer long, just in just the crisper drawer, not doing anything special to them. I mean, it's, if you, if you think about, you got to think that way too, of trying to, I'm um, just, what would work best for you and your storage situation. But be selective on yeah. variety by longevity. Yes. And how long how long it would last is is yeah. some of your best advice yeah. to just a backyard producer. Yeah, and I, I mean, and when you're how she was talking about rootstocks, I, there are so many different rootstocks to go from a full size tree to down to something about the size of a shrub. But um, if you look into that, you will find that some of them now are disease resistant. Some of them are more woolly apple aphid resistant. So they can help get rid of some of your problems for you. And then if you do get a bigger tree, it, if you can get it growing and get it bigger, it will also help protect it from other animals, deer, what have you. Bear. Bear, yeah. We don't have a lot of bears in the eastern panhandle, but I know once you get into the middle part of the state of West Virginia, they have a lot more problem with that. Yeah, we, we know some people in Charlottesville, Virginia, and they always talk about 
a week before their peaches are ripe and ready to pick that the bears just start destroying the trees. <laughs> that it's a constant battle keeping them ran out of them. Does anyone else have any questions for Julie and Phil um, before we start to wrap this thing up? Okay, well, I've got I've got one more for you, and then we'll get out of here. It, like I said, you're you're way past backyard production with with the amount of of product that you're you're running. And Phil, you and I I spoke a little bit about um, your markets and the marketability of an Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia apple. Could you just speak a little bit about where your product goes, where someone could find your product, um, and and so maybe some of the time that it took to develop those market opportunities, and and um, how someone with ambition that wants to start a homesteading here soon, but really wants to ramp up production very quickly um, once those three to four to five years start. Um, how do you go about getting the reach that you all do because it's so extensive? Um, all, Julie's father, father does all of our sales, and that's just been over many years of just building relationships. Most of our apples go into the south, southeastern part of the United States, uh, different terminal markets in the Carolinas, uh, Alabama, Florida. Uh, we have sometimes we send stuff to the capital market in Charleston. Um, as far as you fi find in a place to sell to, there's, let's say there's almost every town, at least around this area, has a, a farmer's market that um, always has a couple fruit growers, a couple vegetable growers, a couple meat people. And it's, I mean, it's a good way to get started small. Um, Maybe you find that you can do something better with that and you can start moving that way. But all of ours have just been through time of finding different people to go to. Um, Julie's granddad back in the 50s started taking apples and watermelons and cantaloupes in the back of his trucks into Martinsburg, paying the different kids that lived on the farm to sell to the people in the town. And this went to what we are now to going by the tractor trailer load multiple states away, um, even into the Caribbean, if the prices are right, depending on the year. I would also like to put a plug in there for the West Virginia FFA. Uh, we sell to pretty much all West Virginia FFA high schools in the month of November and December as a fundraiser for the FFAs. And so if you are looking to get some Appalachian apples, um, get a hold of your local high school FFA group and just ask about their apple sales that are coming up because they're going to be selling apples from the Eastern Panhandle. They're also going to be selling citrus. And uh, that's a really big fundraiser for our FFA kids. And so we're really proud of that. We work really hard with those FFAs throughout the year to kind of open up um, channels for them, how to get them there, how to get them advertised, how to get them into the hands of West Virginia residents. And so that's one thing that We've kind of built up over the last five or six years, and we're pretty proud of that program. Um, yeah, we went from seven or eight high schools to. We've probably got twenty five yeah. high schools now that are that are selling Appalachian Orchard Company apples through their apple sale and gaining two or three high schools every year. So. And hopefully once all the COVID stuff's done, we'll start doing some stuff with their BOAG classes and things like that, doing little lessons with different high schools, too. Yeah, leading up to their FFA sales, we were looking to get into doing some um, just basic classes on how do apples grow, what are the different varieties, what um, what are the differences in varieties, what can you use them for, um, what's the business behind orcharding. Um, we had kind of developed this whole series of, of agricultural lessons that Philip and I both as teachers uh, were really excited about taking around the state of West Virginia and uh, then COVID hit and kind of put a stop to that plan for now, but that is in that is in the works and that is something that we're really looking forward to. 
That's fabulous and good to hear because um, we've got to teach our youth where local food comes from because a lot of them uh, aren't aware. They're aware of the grocery store, but have no idea where the product comes from. Uh, we started talking probably five or six years ago about the FFA fruit sales and, and utilizing West Virginia product. Um, so I'm ecstatic to hear that you're you're covering a good portion of the state with with some of your fruit into those FFA sales. It's it's a big, big help to everyone, to our students, to I'm sure to you all, um, but to keep that that dollar um, and that product staying in West Virginia is tremendous. So that is tremendous to hear. Uh, do we have a question here? Uh, yes, from Bonnie. Could you go over spray schedules, uh, Julie or Phil? Um, we, our spray schedule, um, we have a scout that helps us with it. I'm doing a lot of the scouting for us. Um, but the, we basically go with the, the spray guide that's um, done in conjunction with Virginia Tech, WVU, Virginia State. University, um, you can find it online. They come out with a new one every year. Uh, it's called uh, a spray schedule. But in general, we start um, right as soon, as, right before pre-bloom, with a just a fungicide to pretty just a copper spray fungicide, just to kind of like um, disinfect the whole tree. And then we're just on a. 10 to 14 day window after that trying to see what insects are out there uh seeing what disease pressures out there different times of years have different problems once the bees come in we don't spray insecticides and then just following the labels up until the uh harvest time we do a lot of an integrated pest management where we're doing more scouting than spraying anymore. Um, you're really trying to target any spray that you put on the tree to make sure that number one, it's worth its value because it costs big dollars to put any application on a tree. And number two, you know, to protect the environment, you try hard not to spray anything that you don't have to. Um, there's so many beneficial insects that you don't want to target. And so it's, it's very, very precise. And um, I would say that you do more scouting anymore than spraying. Those guys are in yeah. the orchard every week, multiple days, checking on sticky traps, checking on leaves, looking at fruit, um, yeah. watching the trees, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, our spray guy who travels through most of Berkeley County, Jefferson County, and then a lot of um, Virginia, he's at our place once a week and we're scouting together, seeing if we both agree with what we're seeing. Um, your early early part of the season springtime is usually a wetter time so you're usually is usually a more of a spray time but your goal is get everything under control and then hopefully by summer you're stretching it to almost three weeks if you can uh this year we were pretty happy that we only had to put one spray for a toddling moth on so uh, what we're doing is working and uh, you're just trying to do that cost benefit of what the threshold is, the trap, what the threshold is, and can we push it a little longer? And hopefully we can. And and I will add that for homesteaders, I think that there is a lot more pest pressure. Uh, it's a little different when your 20 apple trees are surrounded by 2,000 more apple trees, um, not an, an acre of woods. Uh, there's a lot of different pest problems that you can run into. There's a lot of different, you know, fungicide and mold problems when you're all shaded out and you don't get a lot of sun or you have a lot of moisture or you're in a, you know, a, a valley. Um, so it, it's really very site specific. I think that that program guide that Philip referenced is pretty useful. It talks about a lot of problems. It goes into what sprays cover for what, you know, insects and fungus. And um, a lot of times there's even pictures associated with that. Um, it's very valuable. It's worth the probably like $18, I think, that we spend on it every year. I would highly recommend if somebody wants yeah, it, to start growing apple trees for that to be their first purchase. And then one another book that um, I assume that's still for sale through WVU 
Uh, the Orchard Monitor is something that when Henry Hogmeyer and Alan Biggs were still active with WVU, they wrote, and it it had it, its spray schedule is more generic, uh, but it's very in depth in covering all your diseases, covering all your insects, showing you what you're looking for. It's more of a how to type book, um, which we still look at all the time now and has all the charts that shows you your wedding hours and things like that for if there is going to be a mold release or whatever. And also, you know, utilize your West Virginia Extension Service. Every county has an ag extension agent and that is that is what they're there for, you know. Reach out to them, tell them what problems you're having. You know, as a general rule, they're pretty pretty congenial about coming out and looking at it and trying to get you answers through the West Virginia system. Very useful information, folks, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, does anybody have anything else for for Julie and Phil before we before we head out of here? If not, I just want to thank both of you for taking the time out this evening uh, to join us uh, to divulge some of this extremely useful information and allowing me to come out to to learn a little bit and get a sample straight off the vine from uh, from some of your trees. It was tremendous. Family loved it. So I can't thank you enough. And um, I hope to be coming out and seeing you guys again here very soon. So I know you've got things to do here this evening, so we'll let you run. But uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if anybody else has any questions, We'll have uh, contact information on their website and how you can get a hold of Julie and Phil at App Appalachian Orchard Company uh, in the future if need be. So thank you all for joining us. And again, Appalachian Orchard Company, thank you for, for taking the time to, to join us for this episode. Thank you, Nathan. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.